is Louis Pasteur. Pasteur was a famous French biologist who conducted a wide variety of experiments on the nature of germs and their relation to disease. Much of our modern medical establishments, treatments, medicines and prevention methods are based on the beliefs and conclusions that Pasteur came to in the mid-1800s. Pasteur believed that germs were what caused disease and that we therefore had to do all in our power to avoid these dangerous germs if we wanted to be healthy and disease-free. This led Pasteur to his famous theory of disease, called the germ theory. It also led him to his famous discoveries and treatments, which are still common practice today. These treatments include antibiotics, pasteurization, vaccination and sanitation. All of these treatments owe themselves to the very theory which Pasteur gave birth to, the germ theory. Now this guy right here is called Anton Bechamp, and he was another French biologist who conducted a wide range of experiments in the mid-1800s concerning the nature of germs, disease, and how diseases arise in the body. Bechamp's experiments and discoveries were conducted at the same time as those made by Pasteur. And as we will see later, it certainly looks like Pasteur was directly inspired by the works of Bechamp. Antoine Bechamp is much less known today compared to Louis Pasteur, but his discoveries remain amazingly interesting and pose a direct opposite to the germ theory as we know it today. Bechamp believed that germs were so-called pleomorphic organisms, which means that they could change their shape and size depending on the environment they found themselves in. Germ theory, on the other hand, teaches us that germs are to be seen as monomorphic organisms, which means they only have one form. Bechamp found that germs and bacteria were not the cause of disease, but merely a result of disease. These bacteria arose in our bodily tissues when microorganisms in our body had to eat large amounts of toxic waste and thus grew into bacteria. This toxic waste could for example come from poor diet, stress or other lifestyle factors. Now in this video we will go further in depth with these microorganisms that Bechamp called microzymus and his terrain theory. But let's start off by first taking a look at how this whole germ theory idea originated, with the main man himself, Louis Pasteur. In the 1850s, Pasteur became fascinated with the causes of how mold developed in different things, specifically the mold occurring in sugar water. He conducted a wide range of experiments and came to the conclusion that the development of mold happened spontaneously and without a direct cause. This conclusion proposed by Pasteur was of course not satisfactory for most people, and therefore many other biologists set out to make their own experiments and studies on the development and origin of mold. The development of mold is also referred to as fermentation. One of these chemists and biologists who conducted these experiments was Antoine Bechamp. In 1854 he proved with simple experiments that what actually caused the fermentation to take place in sugar water and other things was airborne germs. He found that these germs existed all around us, in our environment and in our atmosphere. The reason for the production of mold in sugar water was because certain germs found the habitat of the water suitable for development. The germs thereby decided to stay in this sugar water solution and proceeded to begin the process of ingestion, absorption, assimilation and excretion. This is what created the mold. The mold was a result of nutrient acquisition by the germs residing in the sugar water. The germs would eat, digest and excrete the solution, and this is what created the mold. Or in other words, the germs all around us are living organisms that are constantly partaking in a similar nutritional cycle as we humans are, by eating matter and producing waste. This discovery by Bechamp went about very quietly in scientific circles, and since Bechamp was much more concerned with further development of his experiments and theories, he never really pushed for it to be made popular. Some years later Pasteur decides to revisit his idea on the spontaneous generation theory of fermentation. Pasteur had spent much time mingling and networking with the most important and powerful people in the French scientific circles. It seems that Pasteur had taken note of Bechamp's experiments of airborne germs, and in it he saw a big opportunity to finally gain the scientific fame and prestige that he yearned for. So Pasteur proceeds to completely plagiarize Bechamp's experiments and quickly gains notoriety for discovering that fermentation actually happens due to the existence of airborne germs. Something Bechamp had proved years earlier and something Pasteur himself argued against for a long time. Pasteur made this discovery popular by going on heavily marketed tours around France conducting his 
quote unquote original ideas and experiments on mountaintops, valleys and all sorts of other grandiose places. This really solidified Pasteur's place as the great and revolutionary chemist and microbiologist in France. He gained great fame and responsibility for the future of disease prevention and treatment all throughout France. But in reality all Pasteur had done was to plagiarize the work of another chemist and microbiologist, Mr. Antoine Bechamp. Bechamp actually tried to confront Pasteur on his plagiarization in a famous scientific conference held in France. But Pasteur quickly dismissed it. And since Bechamp seemed much more concerned with continuing his work on the objective truth in nature than gaining fame and notoriety, he quickly let the issue go. Pasteur, on the other hand, seemed somewhat more obsessed with gaining fame through the discovery of breakthrough cures and preventions. This is what led him to what eventually became the germ theory of disease. The germ theory of disease concluded that all germs were to be guarded against and that they should be killed as much as it was possible. The work and discoveries of Pasteur certainly seemed to be done with the mindset of helping people and benefiting society as a whole. However, these discoveries often came into fruition due to immense pressure from the French authorities. This for example shows in the development of Pasteur's anthrax vaccine. In the mid-1800s, France was seeing huge deaths of sheep all across the country from a mysterious disease. Pasteur was called into action to solve the matter, and under a lot of pressure, he quickly came up with a solution in the form of a vaccine. Initially, it seemed that the vaccine worked, however, it quickly turned grim as vast amounts of sheep started dying all across France. These sheep were not dying due to the disease anthrax, but from the injection put into them by Pasteur in order to prevent the disease. Surely this should have proved to people that Pasteur was not the infallible god that he was put up to be. However, his great influence on disease prevention and treatment went on, and so did the developments of the germ theory of disease. This failure on Pasteur's part is not an argument against the efficacy of vaccines, but proof that medical and scientific malpractice can be very dangerous. As to why injecting large amounts of animals with a certain substance can end very bad, I would like to refer to this quote by Dr. Montag Leverson. When a drug is administered by the mouth, in proceeding along the digestive system, it encounters along its way a series of chemical laboratories, wherein it is analyzed, synthesized, and harmful matter prepared for excretion, and finally excreted, or it may be ejected from the stomach or overcome by an antidote. But when nature's coat of mail, the skin is violated, and the drug inserted beneath the skin, nature's line of defense is outflanked and rarely can anything be done to hinder or prevent the action of the drug, no matter how injurious or even fatal it may be. All physicians of the world are incompetent to either foresee its action or to hinder it. Even pure water has been known to act as a violent and fortrian poison when injected into the bloodstream. How much more dangerous is it then to inject poisons whether modified or in any other manner? These simple considerations show that vaccination should be regarded as malpractice to be tolerated only in the case of extreme danger, where the educated physician sees no other chance of saving life. Now there actually is a lot of other stuff to go into when it comes to Pasteur's rush disease treatments and how it has somehow still made its way into our current medical practices and our overall belief in germ theory. But it's a very long story and since I have a lot of other very interesting stuff that I want to touch on in this video, Maybe it's best saved for another time. For now, let's shift our focus to what Pasteur's lesser known counterpart, Antoine Bechamp, was discovering, while Pasteur and his germ theory was being lifted up as the world's new and great savior. As briefly mentioned earlier in this video, Antoine Bechamp made some extremely interesting discoveries when it comes to what he believed constituted life and disease. The most fascinating of these discoveries was definitely the discovery of what Bechamp called Microsimus. Microsimus are essentially infinitely small microscopic organisms. With great amazement, Bechamp managed to find these small microscopic organisms in prehistoric stones that were millions of years old. Even though the stones were millions of years old, the microorganisms were still very much alive. Bechamp interpreted these microscopic organisms to be survival life forms from past ages. He went on to find these microscopic organisms in all other living and dead things he examined, be it animal, human or plant matter. Although all the microsimus looked similar, they varied in their chemical abilities. Each tissue, organ or gland in the body had microsimus that differed from each other. 
that the microzymas would be able to grow into bigger organisms, like for example bacteria, if the environment demanded it. Some of these intermediate bacterial stages were regarded by germ theory proponents to be different species altogether, but to Bechamp they were all related and derived from the microzymas. Bechamp noted that without oxygen, microzymas did not die, they simply went into a state of rest. He said that every living being has arisen from the microzymas and that every living being is reducible to the microzymas. The microzymas were the fundamental components of life. Microzymas thereby completely shattered the previously held belief that cells were the fundamental units of life, a thought that still seems dominant today, even though, as we shall see in a bit, the existence of microzymas have been proven further. Actually, the cells in our body owe their very existence to the presence of these small pleomorphic microzymas, who constantly make sure our cells are healthy and plentiful. When humans, animals or plants die, the microzymas live on and continue to be the ultimate cleaning men of nature by slowly decomposing the body that they were once a part of. This seemed like it should have been a huge discovery, completely changing the landscape and concepts of germ theory as it was currently known. However, the discoveries were simply disregarded by Pasteur and other germ theory microbiologists in favor of their own research and pronouncements. These people kept their belief in the notion that bacteria and other microorganisms only had one form and that these forms were the cause of disease. This is for example shown in the famous germ theory proponent Robert Koch, who was obsessed with isolating these different bacteria and relating them to different diseases. He would for example take something like a streptococcus bacteria and notice how it was present in almost all people having a strep throat. Thereby he concluded that the streptococcus bacteria caused the strep throat. What Koch failed to realize was that the bacteria wasn't the cause of the disease, but merely a result of it. The bacteria is actually the good guy, it's there to eat up all the toxic waste that are in the tissue. It is simply found in the diseased tissue, because some other outside factor is making our inner environment toxic. This could very well be diet and lifestyle but could also be things like stress, poor air quality, EMF radiation, and countless other things. The observation of bacteria in deceased individuals is thereby just a sign of the microorganisms doing their job in cleaning up deceased tissue. If you see firemen around a burning building, would you think that they were the ones who caused the fire? The truth is that these microorganisms play a huge part in our overall health and well-being and they seem to morph and change shapes depending on the environment and state of our bodies. Most people are slowly starting to see the importance of microorganisms in our health and well-being, as things like probiotics and gut microbiome have become important buzzwords. Bechamp literally tried to warn us about the gut microbiome and the importance of these microorganisms years ago. However, we didn't listen then and we still seem very much caught up in the germ theory dogma which has taken deep root in our scientific and medical circles and honestly seems ingrained in all of us. The ideas put forth by Bechamp should have completely changed the way we look upon prevention and treatment of disease. Instead of treating disease as some random thing that could happen to anyone at any moment due to dangerous germs attacking us from the outside, we would actually focus on improving the inner and outer state of our bodies. This could for example be done through a healthy and nourishing diet and stress-free lifestyle. Yet today we seem much more concerned with finding the right antibiotic, cleaning agent or injection to solve our health problems. Since Bechamp's discoveries on microzymas and the pleomorphic nature of germs, the little microscopic and ever-changing life forms have been largely ignored and swept under the rug. However, few microbiologists have tried to bring the theory back into light. One of these microbiologists is Gaston Nassans, who developed something called the somatoscope. With the somatoscope, it finally became possible to view these small microzymas in live action. Up until the invention of the somatoscope, blood samples could only be viewed in their dead states with electron microscopes. But with the somatoscope, it became possible to prove the existence of these small microzymas in different blood samples. Gaston Nassans had a different name for the microzymas. He called them somatids. Nassans was able to show how these different somatids could morph into bacteria and even fungi. 
He was even able to divide the whole process into a 16 step cycle. The first three stages are seen in the blood of all individuals, as well as the saliva, urine and seminal fluids. Whether or not these small somatids and bacteria would then develop further into their pathogenic forms is determined by the state of the internal environment. The pathogenic stages of Nassan's somatid cycle culminate in the formation of a thallus, which are microscopic sacs that eventually burst, releasing more somatids and initiating the entire cycle all over again. Like Bichamp, Nassan showed that actual disease was produced when the compromised health and environment of the individual presented an opportunity for it to arise. Since then, the pleomorphic nature of germs have been captured many times. It is what happens, not what it is, but what happens to this rod bacteria that is significant because it's going into what I then videotaped and captured for the first time that I know of, and I've showed this at Vienna University, I've shown this at Chinua University, I've shown this at Oxford University, and now we're showing this at Harvard University, which has never been seen before, the biological transformation of bacteria into a red blood cell and then bacteria out of the red blood cell. It's reversible. I can't help but wonder why this huge field of study is still largely ignored in medical circles today. I also can't help but notice how hard it is to even find information on this topic. I for example had to go through various loopholes to even find any information at all on Gaston Nassans and his invention of the somatoscope. It seems weird to me that someone who developed a very complicated microscope and proved with it that we are composed of small pleomorphic microorganisms doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. It also seems very weird to me that the existence of microzymes as discovered by Bichamp and proved further by Gaston Nassans still isn't seen as the fundamental components of life and that we are still clinging to the thought of microorganisms as monomorphic enemies to be killed with medicine and that the cell is the fundamental component of life. Today there is a lot of talk and focus on things like stem cell research, however it seems weird to focus on this when 100 years before stem cells were even discovered, Bichamp had already discovered the very creators of the stem cells the microzymes. Studying stem cells instead of studying microzyma is like using a gas lamp instead of an electrical lamp, or a steam locomotive instead of an electrical train. The bottom line is that stem cell, no matter how small or undifferentiated, is still a cell. A microzyma is a whole nother entity altogether. The longest living stem cells live between 5 months to 3 years before dying out. Microzymes lives on forever. Microzyma has never been observed to perish. They are immortal as far as can be estimated. They are like the undying cosmic dust of our world. Or to quote Blavatsky, nothing ever dies. Life's opposite is not death, but latency. One is compelled to ask whether all humanity, past and future, is not imprisoned in latent form in the rocks and sands of our celestial sphere. I realized that this might be getting a little philosophical, and that science has little or nothing to say about spirit, soul, and the hereafter. But if disease is indeed caused by the accumulation of too much toxic waste for small pleomorphic organisms to handle, it would indicate physicians have been unable to see what was quite plain for some 19th and 20th century scientists to observe using a simple light microscope. And with powerful electron microscopes, there is now little excuse for not seeing bacteria. In addition, scientists cannot seem to agree where life begins, so can we trust them completely to know when life ends? In the Bible, God tells us that we came from dust and to dust we shall return, which is not terribly encouraging for many people. But what if dust contained elements and building blocks that could remake life over and over again for all eternity? And isn't Earth basically a big pile of dust? I believe that the study of these ever-living microscopic organisms deserves to be brought back to the light, and that it may provide us with huge clues of what it takes to prevent and treat disease. I believe that terrain theory should be taken seriously, and that we largely need to rethink our approach when it comes to germ theory. We simply gain nothing by walking around in this more or less paranoid thought that disease is something that can strike us at any time and that we need to guard ourselves against these quote-unquote dangerous airborne organisms. The reality is that diseases seek their natural habitat. 
the seized tissue, and that we gain nothing by constantly seeking to destroy these organisms, which are only trying to help us survive. All of this can be summed up quite shortly in the words of Bishamp himself. Nothing is lost, nothing is created, all is transformed. Nothing is the prey of death, all is the prey of life.